Today we're going to deep dive into how you make the perfect steak at home. Steak in general is amazing. It's dramatic, it's beautiful, the sizzle, the sear, the like everything about it is amazing. Wait, too many amazings, I'm getting too excited. <laughs> Today, I wanna to bring it back to basics and just go, okay, first of all, how do we get the perfect crust? Number two, the perfect cook through the center. Three, what do you do about resting? Is it important or not? Four, does seasoning make a difference? When do you do it? When do you add the salt? And what impact does that have? We're gonna break all of those things down, test them all out, and at the end, we're just gonna make the most perfect steak at home. So let's do it. So right here, right now, we're gonna start with searing. So why are we doing that? This is the way my brain works, okay? So we wanna get the outside of the steak and how we do that done properly first because it doesn't matter what method we test later on, it's always gonna come back down to the sear on the outside of the steak. So when we're testing searing, the important thing is to test equipment. So I've taken four pans that are most commonly used at home, nonstick, griddle, cast iron and carbon steel. So I'm gonna bring up each pan to a surface temp of 260 and then sear the steaks two minutes each side until the steaks reach medium rare or 60 Celsius. And then we're gonna see what the crust looks like on the outside, just the crust. That's what we're looking at here. Let's start with the nonstick. I'm using this uh, pizza oven gun to measure the surface temperature of that pan, which is now at 260. So let's go. Now I'm gonna salt my steak, add the oil, and do the searing. Now if you're wondering, while I'm waiting for my two minutes here, uh, I am using a vegetable oil today because it has a really high smoke point. So when oils reach their smoke point, they start to degrade um, and can start to break up, and you kind of want an oil with the highest smoke point to get the highest sear. But a good olive oil, not extra virgin, which has a low smoke point, but an olive oil would be good, or a rice bran oil, that's the kind of nitty gritty that you can get into when you're doing steak cooking at home. But today for the standardized testing, it is vegetable oil. You know, I don't think that's not too bad. I think the issue here is that because nonstick pans, particularly like cheap ones, often warp, so you kind of got like an odd shape of the pan down the bottom. So then you've got this part here, which has barely any color at all and then these edges which are really dark brown. So it's just a bit of an uneven sear. Second flip and see this is where the issue happens when you've got a pan that is not really thick and sturdy. So what's happened is that steak has hit the pan at a really high temp and then the steak has dropped the temperature of the pan and you can see that this second side is not really getting that lovely crusty sear at all. So I think this is one of the issues that you find with pans like a cheap non-stick where you don't really have the heat retention. Okay, so what are the results here? The problem is that with a cheap non-stick, you don't have the heat retention. So when I turn the steak over, the heat loss from the pan never recovered. And this side didn't get the great sear that the first side did. So in my opinion, it's a bit of a fail because I don't have an even crust on both sides. Next up, let's talk about griddle pans. So the idea here is that you have these raised bars in the pan and the raised bars are what come into contact with the steak and you get those like bar marks that you see if you're grilling outdoors or like on a particular steak ad or like char grill burger ads. Like, you know, our brain is trained to think that those bar marks are a good thing. Whether or not they are, let's talk about that later on. We'll give the pan its chance to do its thing. Okay, I'm gonna get this up to temperature. I should mention this is also a non-stick surface. So you wanna be careful that you don't overheat non-stick. It's recommended to be up to about 250, 260. <laughs> I do it at home with the kids and they get so excited. <laughs> ah, you shot me! <laughs> okay, we're good to go. So in order to get the bar marks that people typically want when they're using the griddle pan, you just only want a little bit of oil here. Okay, steak going in. 
I think the griddle pan also really came into its own like in the 80s when everyone was afraid of fat. They wanted to extract as much fat as possible so it wasn't in the food that they were eating. Fat, 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 fat. We'll show you some ways straight from the book to cut down on the fat in the food that you cook. Are you ready? So I guess the other thing with the raised grill bars is that the fat kind of like comes away and drains away from the steak. I, I, I love fat, fat is flavor, I'm not into that, so you can already tell I'm a bit like meh about the griddle pan. I'll try not to be biased. So the idea here is that you get the grill marks and then you like move the steak so you get that like crisscross action happening. So you can see we have the caramelization, but we only have it where the bar marks are. So yes, it looks like it could go in a steak ad, but is it really the best way to get a good crust and a good flavor? So if we talk about what the crust is, it's essentially the Maillard reaction. Now you guys have heard me mention this so many times in my videos, particularly when I'm stir frying. The reaction that's happening when foods that have amino acids and proteins and sugars like a steak react with the heat and get all caramelized and brown and that is what releases like a whole array of flavors and aromas. Now by using the griddle pan we're only getting that reaction in the areas where we have the griddle touching the steak. All right so pretty good for a steak ad. For me it's not the thing. I want to have full contact, crust, sear, Maillard reaction, everything on the entirety of my steak and not just on those little grill marks. And you can, if you have a look, like it looks pretty sad in between those grill marks. I mean, there's just almost no color at all. So for me, it's a no. If you like the look of that though, you go ahead. It's a no for me. Next up is cast iron. So this is like really heavy duty stuff. In fact, it's actually very heavy actually. <laughs> uh, but it is valued for its great sear and heat retention. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what my cast iron pan does in this experiment. I'm gonna have to burn this dress. <laughs> We're all gonna smell like steak. <laughs> Okay, let's go for the flip. We're ready for the flip. Ooh, that's nice. Lovely Maillard reaction caramelization going on there. Pretty even, I gotta say, I like that. Yeah, I think you can see immediately this second flip, a lot more color than the non-stick flip. In fact, it's holding its heat so well. I'm just gonna turn that down. So it's starting to get a little too hot in here. She see me? <laughs> okay, let's talk about what's going on here. A beautiful crust, lovely and even. Both sides have a lovely color. So that means that when the steak hit the pan, we did have a really good heat retention. I mean, this is really where I want to be with a seared crusty steak. My pros and cons. Cast iron pans are very heavy. So they are heavy to move around. It is a bit harder if you're butter basting and you want to get some action with the pan. The other thing with cast iron is that you do need to treat it nicely. It's not a big deal, but you do have to keep it nice and oiled and seasoned. That actually helps develop really great flavor as well, FYI, but it is a little more care and maintenance than say a non-stick pan. But I mean, that color, I reckon it's worth it. I'm getting like smoke eyes here. <laughs> okay, so while we were getting close ups of the cast iron steak, we had to open up all the doors. Um, <laughs> It's really smoky and the pan just kept smoking. And that is one more thing to add about cast iron. When it heats up, it heats up and it holds the heat, which is really great. Uh, but when you turn the heat off, it still continues to hold the heat for a very long time. So you will get a lot more smoke. And if you do have your steak resting in the pan, it can overcook. Um, just one little point I wanted to make because we were, as we were getting smoked out. <laughs> <laughs> the last pan on our list to test here is carbon steel. Now, if cast iron is like our OG of steak pan technology, carbon steel is the new guy on the block. It still has the same heat retention properties that cast iron has, but it's a lot 
lighter. So easier to maneuver around and base things and move it around the kitchen, for example. Now, full disclosure here, I am using my own Mako black carbon steel pan here simply because it is my favorite carbon steel pan, but there's no fudging the results or anything here because you're gonna be able to see for yourself how it performs in the sear test. Ooh, I love that sound. Okay, let's flip. That's a great craft. Love, love, love. This is what I'm talking about with like an all over coverage with the sear and the crust and the Maillard reaction. On this second flip, again, I'm looking for evidence of heat retention, how well the pan has held the heat. And that is stunning. Look at that. Look at that crust go. Ah, so good. So what are we looking at here, friends? We are looking at a beautifully seared, even crust steak, both sides, beautiful. Exactly what I'm looking for when I'm cooking steak at home. This is amazing. I've turned the heat off. Already this pan is less smoky than the cast iron one. So that's that heat reaction or the reactivity I was talking about before. But I mean, you know, if you're talking about crust and sear, it's gotta be for me either cast iron or carbon steel. Preferences here, look, I prefer the carbon steel. It's lighter, it's easier to use, and it has a better reactivity to high and low heat, but both have a really good sear. In my book, I'm gonna go with the carbon steel. Okay, so we've nailed the sear, but what about the rest of it? Just as important, really. So what am I looking for when I'm talking about cooking methods? Well, I want a method that's quick and easy and convenient to do in my home kitchen. I also want my steak to end up with a beautiful, lovely pink blush from crust to crust, evenly cooked, tender and juicy. It's not too much to ask, is it? <laughs> I'm gonna explore four different very common ways of cooking steak. Number one, I'm gonna test the original OG method that a lot of people still use, the hard sear and the one flip only. Number two, I'm gonna check out sous vide. Okay, it's not everyone's cup of tea, it does involve some technology, but I think it's worth seeing if it's worthwhile. Number three, the reverse sear. Low and slow first in the oven and then a hard sear at the end. Number four, we're gonna take the essence of that OG traditional method. So we're gonna do everything in the pan, but we're gonna flip often and we're gonna cook slower. So let's see what works best. So I know I'm using a lot of gadgets today, like the surface temperature thermometer, uh, the digital thermometers to check for doneness inside the steak. But really, I also wanna give you some visual cues as well. So that smoke is one visual cue, and I have a really nifty technique later on for kind of like fudging the digital thermometer too. So we'll get to that later. The conventional wisdom about the one flip was that you would lose juices by flipping the steak often, as in like the juices would literally come out as you moved the steak around. Anyway, we'll see through our testing, won't we? Oh, that's good. The original method I was taught was you're not even supposed to touch it. Oh, sorry, I wasn't even supposed to touch it, was I? I just was, everyone's gonna have a peek. Don't touch it, don't look at it. How do you know with the one flip? Like, what if you flip it and then you're like, oh, Crap, I need to flip it again. What? I'm supposed to wait to like get blood on the top and then it's the cube. See, so that's another thing, like to get the blood on the top, yeah. but like you don't always get blood on the top. There's like one little speck there. It's enough. It's still yeah. blood. Okay, all right. So, okay, so we'll go with that. I'm going to flip it. Yeah, you ready? Good crust, not going to lie. I'm using a digital thermometer here to check the temperature of my steak. I think that you want to pull the steak off at around about 50 Celsius because when we get to the resting stage later on, you'll see steak actually rises in temperature as it rests. But the point with this is that even if you don't have a fancy digital thermometer, if you just have like a metal skewer, any old metal skewer, and you poke it into your steak and then you rest it just on your top lip here, you can feel how hot the inside of the steak is. So if it's cold, it's rare. If it's like just warm, it's like a medium. And if it's really ripping hot, then you kind of stuff it up, the steak's well done. Unless you like it well done. Nothing wrong with that, it's not my preference. For the purposes of this section of testing, I am going to rest the steaks before I slice them, but we will come back and do some resting tests a little bit later on. But in the meantime, each step of the way will rest, test, 
and see what happens. Okay, so let's get in here. The crust obviously looks beautiful, but we've established that. So what I want to see is what's happening inside. Lovely and pink through the center. Thank you very much. <laughs> what we do have is a slight gray band around here. And you can see that the blush pink runs through the center. And look, I would not be unhappy with this piece of steak. It's fine. I just think we can do better. This gray band to me is not optimal. This is where the steak has dried out a little around here, which means it's gonna give you that tougher mouth feel. What I want is to see this pink right crust to crust. Can we achieve it today? For me, the OG method is fine, but can we do better? This experiment is all about throwing our steak into a bucket of water, essentially. Not quite. Sous vide is a technique where you vacuum seal your protein and then you pop it into a water bath at a certain temperature and cook it to that temperature. Now, why would we do this? <laughs> It sounds weird and crazy, but the idea is that the protein temperature, the internal temperature, can't go any higher than the precise temperature of the water bath. So basically, you're cooking the center of your protein to the exact temperature that you want, and then all you need to do is quickly sear it so that you've got the crust and you've got the perfect internal temperature. So that is the idea. Let's see if it works. I need to salt my steak, put it into a special watertight bag, and then vacuum seal it. The bag gets dropped into a water bath that's set at 50 degrees Celsius, and it needs to cook for at least two hours. It can actually go up to six hours, but you need at least two hours to get the steak up to the right temperature. Two hours later, your steak will look like this. I know it looks a bit grim at the moment, but it will look sexy soon. Trust me. Steak comes out. Ooh, kind of feels a bit jiggly. It's not the greatest feeling. <sighs> now, one thing you do have to make sure you do is actually pat dry the steak really well, because of course, it is kind of like wet and steamy in there, and that is not gonna help with our crust when it's super dry. Now we kind of treat the steak like we would any other, just heat the pan up really high until you get that smoking point, add in the oil, a little bit more salt here, and then sear that steak. It only needs like maybe one or two minutes each side because it is pretty much cooked all the way through. Now take it off and let's have a look at what's happened. So I think this looks really exciting. The crust is lovely. I'm hoping for a nice, beautiful interior. Let's have a look. Yeah, I think that looks really nice. I think that we have a lovely blushing center. I don't know, I might have overdone it on the searing a little. I've still got a little bit of a gray band here. Maybe I was a bit overzealous, but I feel like there's a little bit more consistency here. Maybe if I did it again, I might do the sous vide up to like, I don't know, or maybe I'd do a less temperature, lower temperature and sear it. Cause I guess I was waiting to get the caramelization on the sear, but that took a little bit longer than the raw steaks. So that's why I kept it in the pan for a bit longer. But look, I think that is a beautiful looking steak. And the thing is that I know that the flavor of this will be really juicy. So let me just get in here and just cut a piece open for you. Because I think the texture difference with a piece of sous vide steak is very different. See, this is the thing you guys can't see on camera. That texture is literally melting in my mouth. Whereas the original OG method, you could see that you had a very much deeper gray band there and it was a lot drier. This steak is juicy. Wow, that is really good. Flavor wise, you can't knock it. Crust wise, maybe not as good as like a raw salted steak, but cooking consistency, pretty good. You still got a little bit of a gray band though, but geez, it tastes good. Is it worth the extra like one to two hours of cooking though? I think we'll have to do the other experiments and see. This next method is called the reverse sear, which is exactly what it sounds like. We actually cook the center of the steak first, very slowly in the oven, and then do the searing at the end. So reverse searing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a technique that's widely used in a lot of homes, including mine. I quite like this technique. Uh, made very popular by a guy called Kenji Lopez Alt. Love his food knowledge and experiments and his blog and his YouTube channel and his books. But let's just see how it stands up against all of our other tests that we're doing today. So the idea here is that we salt, 
a little bit of oil. I've put the steak here on a wire rack and that's to allow really good air circulation around all sides of the steak so that one side isn't sitting on like a really hot tray for example. I'm going to cook this steak at 120 Celsius in my oven and the idea is that I want to bring it up to 30 degrees Celsius because that's half of my desired internal temperature which is 60 Celsius. So I'm going to use a digital thermometer just to make things a little bit more precise. So at this point my steak has been slowly coming up to temperature in the oven and now I just need to give it a really hard sear. And one more thing here, we have had quite a lot of moisture here particularly from the salt and also the meat juices that have come up to the surface of the steak in the oven. Super important that you pat that dry because again I want to get the crust and the sear done really quickly before I overcook the steak through the centre. I'm going to add a little extra salt here. I know we did salt the steak before it went in the oven, but I do want to get a nice salty crusty sear oil. Alright, this is looking good. I feel like that sear was a lot quicker than the sous vide sear. I'm very excited about this one. I think it looks really great. The crusty sear was a lot easier to achieve on this piece than it was on the sous vide piece, which I'm comparing the two because essentially both are kind of like a reverse cook. Let me stop talking and get right in here and have a look though. Yeah, I think that is pretty stunning. You have probably the most consistent pink that we've had out of all the steaks that we've cooked today. So really lovely char, really lovely even pink all the way through. The other thing I want to test here obviously is the texture. It's really beautiful, it's really juicy, really nice, but, and you guys can't see the difference here, but I can taste it. So the texture of the sous vide steak was really lovely and soft, almost like, I don't want to describe it like jelly, but a little bit more of like soft jelly texture. It's really silky. Whereas this one, I can really taste like the steak fibers. Like it's not tough, but it's a different texture and less silky and soft than the sous vide. Again, but if you hadn't tried the sous vide, you would love this. The other point here is ease and convenience. So obviously messing about with a water bath and doing a sous vide situation, do I think it's worth the extra bit of beautiful texture that you get? I don't think so. I think I would quite happily go with this rather than spending an extra two to three hours cooking my steak. Yeah, this one's still winning for me. This next method doesn't have like a sexy name like reverse sear or sous vide. It's basically a technique where you flip the steak around in the pan often keeping it moving and also I like to keep the temperature a little lower here than the OG traditional hard sear. What am I trying to do here? So what I'm trying to do is cook the steak a little slower so that we don't get that grey band but we still get a really great crust. Now this is a technique that Heston Blumenthal made very popular and I like it, I often use it at home, it's very quick and convenient, but let's see how it stacks up. I wouldn't normally time this, but I'm gonna like kind of put a guide on here and try flipping my steak every minute. Okay, so this steak has me really excited because it looks great. The crust on here is amazing. It looks very appetizing. And in total, it probably took about 12, 10, 12 minutes, including resting. So convenient, easy, but what does it look like inside? Ah, see, that is so lovely. I love this. I think that it has this really beautiful, lovely, consistent blush top to bottom. Not as much of a grey band as the really harsh sear. So I did this on a lower temp than the original OG One Flip. And it's so juicy and lovely. This, my friends, is looking great. But what is it like in the taste test? Okay, so... For me, that is a 
perfect weeknight steak. Like it is really juicy and tender. I love the crust, I love the flavor. I think the thing that you can't see probably through that lens though is the texture when you taste it, when you actually taste it. So for me, this is a beautiful quick steak, but if you've got like a little bit more time, I think that the tenderness of the reverse here was actually just slightly one up. But I love how quick it is, I love how easy it is, and for me it's like, go to any night of the week steak. Oh god, I could eat that forever, it's so good. Mm. All right, let me break down the whole thing for you. The original OG method to me had too much of a gray band. I thought the beef was slightly tough. Number two, sous vide, beautiful texture, loved it. But would I spend two to three hours making steak all the time? Probably not. The reverse sear, lovely texture. And I think 30 to 40 minutes to cook a beautiful piece of steak really isn't that long. But if you wanna go convenience, time, ease, I think the multiple flip method gives you almost the same result as the reverse sear. Resting. Now, I think this is one of the most important details of cooking a steak. And I think a lot of people think that you can just skip it. I'm saying no, but I'm gonna prove to you why. All right, let's cook two steaks. We'll rest one, and then we'll cut straight into the other one, and you guys can see for yourself. Okay, so I have this steak which has just come out of the pan. This one, I'm gonna give it a rest for like five minutes. Let's have a look and see what happens in the steak as soon as we've cooked it. You can see, look how red that is in the center. So what happens is when the steak's cooking, all that heat concentrates that juice into the center. It's had no time to kind of relax and for all those juices to come back out again. They're all just like tight in there. So that's what happens when your steak comes straight out of the pan. Okay, so this piece has been resting for about five minutes. I typically find for steaks this size, five minutes is perfectly fine. Let's cut in and have a look. And wow, I mean, the difference there is remarkable. This is beautifully even from top to bottom. Remember how we had that really like bloody center in the other one? That difference is amazing. So the clear winner here in my book is the rested steak. Obviously a very important detail when it comes to cooking the perfect steak. One of the other things that people really want to know at home when they're cooking steak, I think, is the seasoning. Do you really need to do it overnight? Does it make a difference if you salt it just before you sear it? Well, we're going to test it out and see. I have an overnight salted steak here. I have a 45 minute salted steak. And this one I'm going to salt just before searing. And then we're going to cook them, come back and see if it's made a difference. All right, let's get in here. I think the only way to test this out is to taste it. First of all, the steak that was salted just before searing. It's a nice salty crust. Tastes good. Now let's try the steak that was salted 45 minutes before cooking. Noticeably well seasoned. The difference between this and this is next level. This tastes beautifully seasoned all the way through. The flavor, even the crust seems like more, I don't know, savory and beautiful. Overnight salting. Okay, in terms of the salty savouriness, maybe just slightly saltier, but not overly so. Like if I was talking about pure salt, 45 and overnight, pretty on par. Do you know what's really interesting though? The tenderness level is like well up there, way more than the 45 minutes. Wow, I mean, this is like really optimal. Oh, for me, if we're going on pure flavor and texture, forgetting about time for a minute, the overnight is the absolute winner. Texture is amazing. It's more tender. The saltiness is out there. The savoriness is amazing. The crust is beautiful. 45 minutes is pretty damn good. Like the seasoning's really great. The savoriness is great. Just doesn't quite hit the tenderness mark of the overnight. The just before, okay, it tastes great. And certainly if you're putting it in a lineup with these three, it's always gonna be the loser in my opinion. But look, if you're just looking to get steak on the table in a hurry, this is not bad. It's better than no salt. All right, I have had so much fun today and actually solidified in my mind exactly what I think the best way is to cook the perfect steak at home. So number one method. 
Look, if you don't have a lot of time and you're after a really quick, convenient, but really good steak, then definitely the multiple flip method is your go-to. If it's the weekend and you've got a little bit more time, the reverse sear is so good and just a tiny leg up on the multiple flip. Now, when it comes to resting, I think it was obvious. You need to rest your steaks for at least five minutes. Now, the one thing that's been a common thread through this entire testing day is the sear. And we did that first up. Now, for me, the carbon steel pan was my favorite pick. Cast iron coming in close second. And when it comes to salting, that overnight, you cannot beat it. I mean, just get the steak out from the supermarket, salt it, put it in the fridge and cook it the next day any way you like. It's gonna make a massive difference, but if you have to, go with the just before or 45. But I mean, in my book, I'm doing the overnight. And that's it for Marion's Steak Guide today.